When I decided to do an episode on the classic Nicktoon cat dog, one question stood out as the hardest one to answer. Should I be using dog memes or cat memes? Pun dog or hover cat? Dancing dog vine or dancing cat vine? How can you choose? You know what? I am heckin' bamboozled. Play me off, keyboard cat. <laughs> Internet. Welcome to Film Theory, the show that makes videos out of all those weird thoughts that keep you up at night. Like this one. You know how Keyboard Cat is a cat that plays the piano? Well, what would happen if you made a piano that was made out of cats? Sounds ridiculous? Well, don't let humanity hear you talking like that, because wonder no longer, Internet, it already exists. It's called the Cats and Clavier. It was imagined, though never actually made, by a German scholar back in 1650. 16! 50. That's right, loyal theorists, cat pianos predate electricity. I'm glad that scholars were working on the questions that truly mattered back then. But anyway, we're here to talk today about a big part of my childhood that I'm pretty shocked I haven't actually done an episode on yet. Nicktoons! Only on Nick Gather round the fire, youngins, because old Dad Pat is here to tell you of a time before cell phones and the internet, when the greatest joy of the weekend was waking up on a Saturday morning, eating half your body weight in Cap'n Crunch, with Crunch Berries, thank you very much, and turning on Nickelodeon for a full slate of Nicktoons hosted by a popsicle stick with googly eyes. Forget your fancy YouTube Flash animators, all you Jadens and Rebeccas and Domixes. D Damik Sai. We had ourselves a stick. His name was Stick Stickly, and we loved him. He had a P.O. Box that rhymed with his name. Stick Stickly, P.O. Box 963. New York City, New York State, 10108. He taught me that I could pick a rose, pick my nose, and oh yeah, I could also pick Nickelodeon's shows. Yeah, they burned those rhymes into your head as a kid back then. I am indoctrinated! Anyway, I loved the Nicktoons, and I related to all the characters in them. I lived in a dream world, and imagined imagined myself as a superhero like Doug, though my superhero didn't wear underwear on his head because, you know, that's a little showy. No one wants to see those tidy whities I was the stick-in-the-mud only child who never wanted to get into trouble like Chucky from Rugrats. Though let's be honest with ourselves here in retrospect, Tommy Pickles was a menace who was a threat to all those other babies and honestly to his parents. And I was tormented by other kids at school like Arnold and Hey Arnold, though I wasn't teased because my head was shaped like a football. It was just because I was a dork. But one of the Nicktoons that always fascinated me the most, at least on a theorist sort to level was Cat Dog. The show, if you haven't seen it, is pretty straightforward. You've got yourself an animal with a cat's head on one side and a dog's head on the other side and a long shared body in between, like a big wobbly hot dog. Cat is a refined intellectual, and dog is, well, he's a doggo. Hijinks ensue. It's funny, it's weird. Hey, a cat dog! Never mind. And it got me wondering all these years later, is a cat dog creature possible? Now, maybe I'm crazy for thinking this. I mean, it is a kid's cartoon for crying out loud. But think about it this way. Cat dog premiered back in 1998. And since then, we've had a few massive scientific breakthroughs from hybrid cars to the human genome project to discovering water on Mars. I mean, just the other day, I learned from a friend that you can clone your dog for like $20,000. And if that sounds like a lot, remember, you are literally creating a genetic duplicate of a living creature with scientific technology that was only perfected in 1995. I wonder if I can clone Skip. That would be weird YouTuber merch. <laughs> You could have a skip of your very own. Save that one for the holiday collection. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing stopping Cat Dog from becoming a reality is the limitation of our own imagination. So today, we're gonna play a little Dr. Frankenstein to see just what it would take to make a cat dog. It would literally be the perfect pet. You got man's best friend crossed with man's most ambivalent friend. Mix the two together and you get, like, man's most pleasant next-door neighbor. I don't know. Now, this episode is all about the scientific possibility of creating a cat dog, but I realize that that starts us off with a pretty big assumption that a cat dog doesn't already exist. Do a quick Google search and you'll find that, yeah, scientists have apparently successfully already bred a cat dog. Well, that was fast. Good show, everybody. See you next week. But hey, of course, then you notice that the scholarly site you're getting this information from is called catster.com. You can't find any record online of the scientists mentioned in their news article, quote unquote. And you realize that the picture of the cat dog hybrid looks like it was made in Microsoft Paint. Fake news is everywhere these days. But there is something here worth mentioning, which is that rumors of 
cat dogs go way back long before janky blog sites. A report in the French publication Le Mercure Galant puts the earliest recorded instance of cat dog hybridization in 1698. There were other well publicized incidents from the 1930s and 1970s in which people claimed to have crossbred or discovered animals that were part cat and part dog. Now, of course, all of these were eventually shot down as hoaxes made by people looking to make a quick buck. Speaking of people who lie to you to steal your money, it's worth mentioning P.T. Barnum here. Yeah, the circus guy. Oh, sure, we all know him as the guy who just had that mad movie musical made after him, and us hardcore musical theater nerds know him as the guy who also has a mass stage musical made after him. But it's important to remember that this is a guy who got famous for doing things like sewing a salmon tail to a monkey skeleton to claim that he had found himself a mermaid. Clickbait is everywhere, ladies and gentlemen, all throughout history. Anyway, my point is that the world's been begging for cat dogs for centuries. There's clearly a market for it. P.T. Barnum and the other swindlers weren't able to do it despite what they were claiming otherwise. So it's my turn to step up to the plate and give the people what they want. The cuppy. It's a cross between kitten and puppy. Actually, it sounds more like a cross between kittens and guppies. The Kippy! <laughs> the most logical way to create a cat dog, it would seem, would be by mating a cat with a dog, thereby creating a hybrid creature that contains traits of both animals. After all, that's how we get animals like mules, ligers, and wolpins, which are combo whale dolphins. And yeah, all three of those things are real. I mean, it's not like you were questioning that mules were real, but ligers and wolpins, yeah, I'm like, whoa, those are real, and yes, yes they are. That's one that they don't teach you in kindergarten. V is for vulture. W is for what the heck is that freak of nature? Just when you thought you knew the animal kingdom, am I right? A big part of the reason these crossbreeds exist is that the animal parents are genetically similar enough to make a viable offspring, which we can demonstrate using a little bit of taxonomy. Now, you may remember that science classifies animals in a variety of different categories, which are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, from least specific to most specific. If you can't remember that, just remember Kanye prefers Coke over flat grape soda, because of course he does, flat grape soda is gross. So consider that to make a mule, you need a donkey and a horse, which belong to the same kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, and genus. Only their species is different, with donkeys belonging to Equus africanus asinus, and horses belonging to Equus ferris cabalus. In the evolutionary scheme of things, horses and donkeys didn't become different animals until very recently, about four to four and a half million years ago. Cats and dogs, on the other hand, are as different as, well, cats and dogs. They're not nearly as similar biologically considering they only share kingdom, phylum, class, and order, then separate into the families Philidae for cats and Canidae for dogs, then further separate out from there. The common ancestors for cats and dogs existed around 70 million years ago, meaning that cat and dog DNA have had that much more time to become different and less compatible. Most hybrid animals breed across species, and very occasionally across genus, and very, very, very rarely across family or even order, so from that very theoretical stance, a cat-dog hybrid would be feasible, but mathematically it's just not gonna happen and create a viable creature. Further adding to the complications is that cats and dogs have a different number of chromosomes, those little bundles of DNA that mix together when we create offspring. Now, I just use mules as an example, and yeah, donkeys and horses also don't have the same number of chromosomes. Donkeys have 62, and horses have 64, so mules have 63. The extra chromosome there isn't gonna rock the boat too much, though it should be said that the odd number of chromosomes here means that except in extremely rare cases, mules are gonna end up infertile. But now let's look at our hypothetical cat-dog hybrid. Here we're not talking about a two chromosome difference, we're talking about a 40 chromosome difference. Cats have 38 chromosomes and dogs have 78. Here's a scientific fact that also qualifies as a fun fact. King crabs have themselves over 200 chromosomes, go figure. What exactly would happen to this 58 chromosomed hybrid is purely theoretical, but when you consider that damage to even a single chromosome in human DNA tends to create a lot of health problems, it's unlikely that a cat dog created this way would have any chance of creating a viable creature, let alone surviving being born. Alright, so even though we can't create a cat dog the old fashioned way, that doesn't necessarily mean we're sunk yet. A number of the show's fans note that cat dog's hometown, Nearburg, is a bit of a desolate barren wasteland with no people and only talking animals, 
and whatever Winslow here is. They have therefore theorized that it may be a sort of post-apocalyptic radioactive wasteland. If so, maybe Catdog is a mutant, and then all we need to do to create our own is find ourselves a leaky nuclear reactor. History tells us that, yeah, high levels of radiation tends to mess with plants and animals in the surrounding area. In the aftermath of the Chernobyl meltdown, local wildlife experienced a number of different mutations. Mutations that I'm about to show you and that, if you don't want to see, now might be a good time to take a 15 second vacation down in the comments. Say hi to everyone else down there who doesn't want to use eye bleach today. Make yourselves a new friend. Everyone scrolled down who wanted to scroll down? fantastic. So in addition to animals that were smaller, thinner, or misshapen in the wake of this disaster, you also got yourself some really crazy results. In particular, animals that had extra body parts, like this lamb with eight legs. And to get a little bit more on brand with cat dog, this donkey with two heads. <sighs> Genetics and radiation, man, it gets weird. Reminds me of that episode of Bob's Burgers with the goat who has two butts. Anyway, all right, comment crew, you can come on back up now. So based on what some of you just saw, it would seem like we have proof that radiation can create a two-headed animal like cat dog, right? Well, no again. And to understand why, we have to get into the science of how these mutations work. You see, high levels of radiation tend to damage cellular DNA. This isn't necessarily a problem because DNA has mechanisms to repair itself, but those repairs aren't always exactly right. It's like taking a shirt to the dry cleaners to sew a button back on. Most of the time, they sew the button back on perfectly, which would be a metaphor for DNA successfully repairing itself. Sometimes they sew the button on, but it's slightly too high or slightly too low, which would be an imperfect but still functional repair. And then sometimes, instead of sewing the button back on the shirt, they light the shirt on fire and cover it in thumbtacks. And that's how you end up with an eight-legged spider sheet. At any rate, these mutations can definitely lead to some strange results, but they're not random. You might get the doubling of certain genes that create legs or even heads, but you wouldn't get an organism with a separate head far away from the first head. Besides, all of the mutations that you're gonna see affect a single organism, and to create an animal like cat dog, you're somehow gonna have to splice the cat DNA with the dog DNA, which radiation and subsequent mutations simply can't do on their own. So it's strike two for our mad science experiment. Which leads us to our third and most desperate option. And it's a dark one, so buckle up. Let's say you're a mad scientist who just can't live in a world without cat dogs, and knowing that you can't interbreed cats and dogs or use radiation to create a mutant cat dog, you decide to take things into your own hands, human centipede style, by surgery creating a cat dog. If you were somehow able to perform the surgery so well that you could merge the two spines and internal organs such that the surgery itself was a structural success, would this cat dog be able to live? Well, you know how when someone needs an organ transplant, you have to do tests to make sure that the possible donor is a match? This matching system has to do with similarities in the blood and tissues between the donor and the recipient. The more differences there are in those tissues, the more likely the body's immune system is going to recognize that organ as foreign, which leads to the immune system attacking it as though it was bacteria or a virus in order to kill it. And cats and dogs, like I've mentioned, are genetically different, so it makes sense that they would reject each other, but that's not the case. Though it happens only in very rare cases, cats that have received a single blood transfusion from a dog usually live. Interestingly enough, cats that receive multiple transfusions tend to reject the blood the second time, which suggests that after an initial transfusion, the cat's body just recognizes it as different from its own blood. It's, it's a weird little phenomenon. But yeah, on the cat side, it is perfectly viable. Dogs, on the other hand, have a very difficult time receiving organ donations at all, cats or otherwise, because the canine immune system tends to attack any tissues that aren't from direct relatives. A dog's immune system literally acts just like a dog. It's overeager, it barks at everything. It's adorable to think about until you consider that it makes biological treatment of sick dogs really, really hard, and then it becomes really sad. Anyway, for the first time ever, it's not the cat's fault. The cat's immune system would potentially allow it to happen, it's the dog that would make this impossible surgery even more impossible. And that leaves us with, um, no crossbreeding, no nuclear fallout, not even mad science is gonna create a cat dog. At the end of the day, we're just stuck with the glory that is doggos and floofs. So I ask again, what's that leave us with? The cartoon. I guess. Which honestly ain't too shabby, and making it even better is that lucky for us, Cat Dog and a bunch of other Nicktoons are available for you to watch right now on Verve. <laughs> oh yeah! If you have a craving to revisit the simpler times of your childhood, or honestly, if you're too young and missed out on some of the best shows to ever air on television ever, Verve has all sorts of must see Nick Splat shows. Doug, ah, real monsters! Nick Arcade, where you actually go into a video game, and shows that you won't believe that they actually showed 
to kids back in the 90s, like Rocco's Modern Life. Seriously, if you have never seen Rocco's Modern Life, just watch it and remember, this was meant to be a show for kids. In fact, if you watch it, come back to this video and let me know what you thought about it, because... Oh boy, times have changed. What is acceptable for kids to watch has changed. Then, Verve also has incredible nostalgic game shows like Double Dare 2000, Global Guts, where, spoiler alert, the purple team never wins, and what is, to this day, still on my bucket list of life, running through a game of Legends of the Hidden Temple. Debate it down in the comments. Were you a red jaguar, purple parrot, blue barracuda, or silver snake? If you're an orange iguana or green monkey, you need not apply. If you're eager for even more nostalgia, they also have Freakazoid and Thundercats. All of this and more courtesy of Verve, where you can get a 30-day free trial of Verve Premium. You heard that right, free of Verve Premium, which gives you ad-free access to 13 channels, including Crunchyroll, Funimation, and Cartoon Hangover. Because seriously, why would you not want to follow up an Angry Beavers binge with Dragon Ball Super and My Hero Akka all in premium HD? All of it is available available on Verve. Get that 30-day free trial of Verve Premium, which includes all those shows and the ability to watch on the go with no internet connection by going to verve.co slash matpat. That's vrv.co slash m-a-t-p-a-t. Seriously, guys, get yourself some nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Only now, in the modern age, in the convenience of your pocket, or computer, or TV, or pretty much any other digital device where you want to watch something. Now play me off, keyboard cat, and remember, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.